Entrepreneurs will save the world. We chat with successful entrepreneurs who share their journey and the lessons learned along the way. The Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast is edutaining, leaving you with actionable advice to transform your life and create a thriving business that aligns with your values and goals. Our conversations are for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life they desire. We focus on the mindset shifts entrepreneurs make to increase their influence and impact in the world. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope called The Dose of Hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You will see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at addvalue2life.com slash dose. Add value to life.com slash dose. Just wanted to mention this episode was recorded earlier. And as our audience grows, we just wanted to share some of the value from our earlier episodes. My guest today is Jesse Smith. Jesse's an established dancer, recording artist, and entrepreneur. Getting his start in the entertainment world when he moved to Los Angeles in 2005 as a dancer with McDonald's Selznick Associates. There he got an opportunity to work with artists like Justin Timberlake, Rihanna, Mario, and more. Since then, he's been using his talents to perform and speak all over the world on stages in front of hundreds of thousands of people. Now Jesse continues to help creatives turn their passion into a thriving business that can make a positive impact on the world through his business, My Creative District. Through My Creative District, Jesse co-founded the Worldwide Dance Challenge, an online dance show competition streamed in 125 countries where they brought dancers from around the world with all different styles to compete head-to-head live online in front of a live audience for a chance to be named the world's best. I'm so excited to have this conversation with Jesse today. Man, Jesse, thanks so much for joining me today. appreciate you jumping in on the show. Absolutely, man. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate the invite. All right. So obviously you've been uh, chasing your dream for a long time. And uh, that's led you to entrepreneurship and, and owning your own thing. And so would you mind sharing some of that story? Yeah, I mean, ever since I was, I mean, my dream when I was a kid was, you know, I wanted to be a performer on stage. My first concert was at three years old, sang the books of the Bible in my church and uh, got addicted to the stage ever since. And so uh, high school, you know, um, I never really, I, I went through the school plan because that was the right thing to do. But in my heart, I knew like being on stage and and performing was what I wanted to do. And so um, I just, I, I, everything that I did was a means to get there. And so uh, I was a one semester college dropout. I went to college uh, by mm-hmm. kind of like a, a referral from my mom because my mom was like, you know, the personality you have, you'd be so good as a doctor. And, and she was a nurse. And so I thought, well, I'll try that out. And, and, uh, but I quickly realized that it just wasn't for me. And, uh, I was in sales doing a lot of sales gigs, but even that was always a means to an end as I was working during the day and I was up all night dancing, um, you know, uh, dancing and, 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 you know, performing and, and doing all those things. And those eventually, you know, as I, as I continued to perform and continue to chase opportunities, I went to, you know, I went to clubs around between, you know, Duluth Superior area where I'm from down to Minneapolis, Minnesota would battle down there, started to get recognized down there. And I started getting scouted by different people. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are kind of just full of you know, full of, full of crap. And they're, they're trying to really sell you a, a, you know, some sort of a PR package or EP kit or something like that. And so I went to tons of those things only to realize that it was just another dead end, but I ended up finding an opportunity to get myself down to Orlando, Florida, um, for an audition actually put on by Lou Perlman, who started, uh, the, uh, in sync and all those guys. And, um, I got scouted. Um, I ended up, you know, out of 1500 dancers ended up top 10 on stage and 
got scouted everywhere from MTV, Caribbean Cruise Line, all the major dance agencies, KSA, MSA, um, and and Clear and Block and all those guys and ended up choosing my choosing my uh, agency and moved out to California 30 days later. And that's when I started really pursuing the whole Hollywood dream. Crazy. So uh, it, it took quite a bit of work and effort to... <laughs> To, to get that opportunity, right? Yeah, I mean, I I uh, I didn't have money for dance classes, and I I didn't start actually dancing as a performer. I was a singer. I I was a glorified band geek, played all the instruments, um, but I didn't start dancing until later in life. I didn't start dancing until I was almost twenty. But that really kind of set me on a trajectory. I started learning how to dance by watching videos on Yahoo. Uh, with the 56k dial-up modem so it was like back in the old school days right and i would buy these like vhs tapes of break dancers and and stuff like that that's how i learned how to dance i couldn't afford dance class so i didn't go to dance class early on and um you know so it was a lot of like literally dancing five six sometimes seven hours a night i and and finding places that you could dance right i I, I would go to clubs. I didn't drink, but I used their dance floor and I used their DJ. And then when they weren't open, I went to the local Walmart back in the cosmetic section between 10 PM and 1 AM. The manager knew I was staying out of trouble. They had the, they had the, um, radio, uh, speaker right above me. And I just danced because they have an awesome, awesome floor and, and it was free. So, you know, that, I mean, you just had to learn how to be resourceful you had to learn how to not stare at all the reasons why you couldn't. And you had to really believe in all the reasons why you should. Absolutely. Well, I like that. Believe in all the reasons why you should. And, and, and really just, just making it happen, right. Willing to practice in Walmart because that's the place that has a speaker and a floor Yep. <laughs> and, and nobody's bothering you. So that's a pretty large commitment to your dream. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I was listening to Dr. Dr. Miles Monroe and he said something that really hit me. He says, you know, work is something that you're created for. A job is something that you do. Hmm. And I've really been thinking about that. He said, you know, he says, if you study the word work and where it comes from, it, it means to be, not to do. Hmm. And that means it's something that's a part of you. It means it's something that you've been created to do. And, you know, I think part of the reason why I was able to put so much energy and time into it is because it wasn't something I had to like put a lot of effort in convincing myself that I needed to practice, right? It was something that was just a part of me. So I just did it. I mean, I was the kid that was dancing down the supermarket aisles. Anytime I could hear a beat or music, like I was working on my dance, I just loved doing it. So I think when you find something that you truly love, that you're truly, that you were truly created for, you're doing work. Yes, but you're not doing a job. And the other thing that Miles Monroe talked about that I thought was really interesting, he goes, think of a bird. A bird is working when it's flying, but <laughs> science has proven that birds actually don't lose energy from flying. It's actually a way that they increase their energy. Whenever you find something that you're doing, whenever you find your work, that thing that you were created to do, when you go out and dance, when I went out and danced for three, four hours, people would be like, are you tired? And I'm like, man, I'm just getting started. <laughs> like I would find more energy, even though I just, you know, laid everything that I had on the dance floor, I'd find more energy from it. So I think for anybody that's out there wanting to, you know, find out where do I, where do I put my time and energy, this dream that I have, find something that gives you energy back. And I can guarantee you that it's going to be in direct line with something that leads you to your purpose. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. Cause when, when you find your passion and purpose aligned, um, pretty good things can happen. Yeah. So 30 days later, you're, you've gone from Orlando to uh, 
to Los Angeles. That's got to be a big transition for a kid from Superior, Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, that's to say the least. I talk about a culture shock. Go from twenty eight thousand people to you know four or five million. It just it's it's a uh, it was a big culture shock. Um, obviously, there was a lot of things that that I liked about it. Um, you know, where I was from, Superior, Wisconsin. I I I, I kind of felt like I was I couldn't fit in. Right. I just I walk different. I talk different. I, I, I thought different, but when I got to LA, like I found all these people that thought like me, that talked like me, that walked like me. And so I felt, I felt like in, to a degree, I kind of found my people. Um, but I quickly also realized that, you know, they, you, you hear that cliche see, saying new level, new devil. <laughs> right. And yes, I found, I got to a new level. I, I was signed by a, a dance agency. I started going to auditions, started to, you know, get to know the people that were already dancing and going on tours with Usher and Justin Timberlake and all these kinds of people. Um, and uh, so that part was crazy cool. But what I really, what I learned very quickly is also I went from being kind of the top dog. I was, you know, a, I was a medium fish in a really tiny pond. <laughs> and then I got from a, a medium fish in a tiny pond to a medium fish in a, an ocean. And, um, I real, I, it humbled me because I, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I kind of got cocky. I was kind of owning the territory where I was at. And I'm like, man, if I'm crushing it this much, when I I'm here, I can't wait to get out to LA and show everybody what's up. Well, I quickly got shown what's up. <laughs> and, um, I not only was not, I, I was not only pre not prepared, you know, skill wise. I mean, obviously I got signed, so I had skill and my agency wouldn't assign me if I was terrible, but you always need to improve and you not, it's not that you always need to improve your skill set. I think the biggest lesson I learned was that I was not prepared mentally for where I was going. Um, it's something that I talk a lot about to the entrepreneurs that I help. Now I help creatives, you know, turn their passion, um, you know, that they, they tried to take to Hollywood and they thought that they failed and that, that it meant that it wasn't supposed to be them. I'm now helping them take that passion and turn it into a business. And I have to talk to them a lot about, you know, it's not so much the skill set that'll hold you back. It's how you're, how you look at life, your mindset, your perspective that'll hold you back. I was not mentally prepared for all the no's. I was not mentally prepared to stay laser focused. I went from 28,000 people to, you know, close to five or 6 million people with all the opportunities to get distracted. And I got distracted. <laughs> Right. I got distracted. I mean, I almost got fired from my agency for not showing up to auditions. Like all sorts of things happened because I wasn't prepared mentally. I was, um, I needed to learn how to look at the landscape differently. And so I think one of the things that so many times dreamers are sitting here, if I just had this, if I just had this level of success, if I just could get this one gig, or if I could just, you know, have this one person endorse me or get this one brand deal, like it would make my life. And I'll say, sometimes your next level will absolutely crush you because you're not ready for it. <laughs> and that's actually what happened to me by going out to LA. Wow. So what, what helped you the most with your mindset? Man, um, well, first of all, a little maturity. <laughs> um, I mean, I didn't really start learning about mindset consciously. Like there was subconscious things that I kind of picked up and stuff. I mean, I went, you know, when I was out in LA, I, I went to a hundred auditions. I heard a hundred no's before I got my first yes. You know, um, that's, that's a lot of, a lot of pills to swallow. A lot of people telling you you're not the right thing and you know you, you got to go back into the drawing board. You got to get better here. You got, and so I just had enough stubbornness to push through that. But again, I still had so many other pitfalls that um, it really ended up crushing me. In 2006, I ended up moving back home to Superior, Wisconsin. I almost committed suicide because I just couldn't mentally handle being back. And I thought because I wasn't in a specific location that my dream was dead. I had lost all my opportunities and I just didn't know how to mentally, I didn't know how to mentally, you know, navigate through that. And, but when I started to learn about mindset, I learned, you know, the biggest thing to keep your focus, the biggest thing to, to 
make sure that you don't lose sight first of all or why you're there but also lose sight of um the fact that just because one way doesn't work doesn't mean another way won't mm. is i constantly i mean i started learning i started reading books i mean obviously that that's kind of cliche now everybody knows read books but like unlimited power by tony robbins started to change my perspective um 15 invaluable laws uh, of growth by john maxwell and started to dive into that and then i started investing in people that would invest back into me i started getting mentors that would keep me focused that would keep me you know that would keep me um looking at the right things and also challenge the way that i was currently looking at my life and currently looking at my situation i love the the quote by wayne dyer that says when you change the way you look at things the things you look at change so many times we're running around trying to find different opportunities it's not sometimes that you need a different opportunity. Sometimes you need a different perspective on the opportunities that are actually already in front of you. Right. And that was the biggest thing that I took away. Um, you know, when I first started to go on this mindset journey and honestly, as soon as I started applying those principles, a lot of my life started to change. Yeah. Imagine that. So now you recognize the value of mentors. What, what are some ways that mentors were able to, to help you? Well, I think first of all is is you're going to have mentors that are 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 going to be there to mentor you through maybe a chapter of your life, and you're going to have mentors that are going to be there that are going to mentor you through you know a um, lot a lot longer stages. Maybe they're gonna they're gonna mentor you through the rest of your life. Um, but the mentors have done three things for me. One one they have. Um, been an open door for me to ask questions. Now, one of the things that I learned is that a mentor will not change your life just as much as a course will not change your life. Um, I, 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 I tell this to people all the time. There is no course on the planet that will work for you. There's no mentor on the planet that's going to work for you. They'll give you information. They'll give you consulting. They'll give you coaching. They'll give you tips. They'll give you ideas. But ultimately, the only person that's going to be able to do the work for you is you. Amen. And so, um, but if you want to be able to get the most out of your mentor, I learned quickly that I had to start asking better questions. You know, John Maxwell says the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the quality of questions that you ask yourself. If you want better results, you need to ask better questions. And so I started learning that I needed to ask good questions. I also needed to learn that information without application is absolutely worthless. <laughs> Carol Dw or, uh, um, Carolyn Leaf, who is a neuroscientist out of South Africa, um, she has a, an amazing podcast. And I heard her say something one time that actually because we're in such a information age, that we are taking in so much information, but we're not actually taking action on that information. And science is showing that it's causing cognitive dissonance because we know what we should be doing, but we're not doing it, which is actually causing physical brain damage. So I had to start learning that, yes, I can ask questions and they can give me tips, but if I don't start taking action, I'm not going to get the result. And one of the things that I found is the valuable mentors that you want in your life. I mean, they're valuable for a reason. They've got great results. They've done amazing things. And so if they're going to take time to mentor you, whether you're paying them to do so or not, it's not because they have, you know, they don't have a shortage of people that they could be helping. Let's just put it that way. So if they're going to give you their time, you better make sure that you give them your attention. And how do you show them that by taking action on the things that they're actually giving you advice on doing? So you can come back and actually show them, okay, this is what I did. And then the other thing that the mentors have taught me in my, in my life is that failure does not mean you're unqualified. Hmm. I've had plenty of, of my mentors have to talk me out of an old mindset that said, 
you know, we're naturally gifted for certain things and we're naturally gifted for, 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 we're not naturally gifted for some, you know, I, I grew up with that old adage, you know, I didn't grow up on the wrong, right side of the tracks. I wasn't the lucky one. You know, I, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. You know, my, my parents struggled a lot of my life and, and, and I had grandparents with bad mindsets when it came to money. And so, um, I often viewed a failure as kind of a sign that that's, that was, that was God's way of telling me that wasn't the direction I needed to go mm-hmm. down. And, you know, one of the perspectives that, that I had to get from a mentor of mine told me, you know, I'm a man of faith. So a lot of the stuff that comes, uh, you know, in and out of my life has to do with God and, 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 and that whole um, sphere of things. But he said, Jesse, he said, if God gave you everything that you wanted right now, you wouldn't be able to hold it because you don't have the, you don't have the character. You don't have the muscles to be able to hold it. Failure is actually our workout plan to be able to give us the muscles that we need to be able to hold the purpose that we are created for the dreams we are created for. So failure is a part of the process. It's not an indication that you should stop. Hmm. So good. And so those three things have really been the, the most valuable lessons that I've gotten from, having mentors. Yeah, that's, that's so terrific. And obviously you've transitioned a lot from, you know, getting those first hundred no's and realizing that a no, a no isn't personal. It just means you're not the right fit for this, for this particular character, this particular, you know, role. Right. And, uh, and, and, and then learning that yes lives in the land of no, if you're never in the land of no, you're never going to find yes. (laughs) And that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> and so having to go to all those all those auditions and keep going to that hundred and first one um, for the for them to say, "Hey, you are the right fit, and this is going to be a great thing," um, because you have had some of those successes, right? I mean, yep. you've gotten to do some really cool things that that launched your career as a dancer, um, and, and then even in the midst of that, life throws us challenges, right? Like. I understand your parents made a decision to move that that's another transition for you. Yeah, they, they moved. I mean, part of the reason why I came home from LA kind of was because um, they were transitioning. They were moving to um, Malawi, Africa to be um, missionaries over there. And uh, you know, so I was to come home to take care of their estate. Now I had a lot of things that were, uh, I have a lot, I had a lot of things that, that happened. Um, you know, I was supposed to be gone for three months. I called my agency, told them, Hey, listen, I'm only gonna be gone for three months. I'll be back. Um, and you know, when I literally parked my car into my parents' driveway, when I drove in, um, August 16th of 2006 or August 15th of 2006, um, I heard a big bang and, uh, looked under my car. I don't know much about cars. Um, I'm definitely not your handyman. I can barely change my own oil and I'm, I'm finally okay with that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I got this, I had to heard this big bang and I looked underneath my, my, my car and it was so loud. My dad came outside, looked underneath my car and my transmission had literally fallen out of my car. Um, and you know, I might've done some cool things, dance with Justin Timberlake, dance with Rihanna. That didn't mean they paid a ton. So I was still a broke performer and it was like, that was really a downward spiral for me. Again, didn't have the mentality, the mindset to be able to handle challenges well. So it was like, my life is over. I lost my, my car. My parents are about getting ready to leave and I don't know what I'm going to do, you know? And, um, but you know, I will tell you this is that some of the most valuable lessons that I learned to set me up for what I'm doing now were learned in some of those really dark moments that happened soon after I moved home from LA. Hmm. Yeah. So I think this is the time you start to shift to from performance to thinking about impact. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I had actually gotten a call out of the blue from somebody. I don't even know how they got my number and they said, Hey, Jesse, um, I'm so-and-so from upward bound. Have you ever heard of that? And I'm like, Nah, I don't know. And they're like, well, it's a program that helps first generation college kids get into college. You know, their parents haven't been to college, their grandparents haven't been to college. 
And we would love for you to tell your story about how you're a small town boy from Superior, Wisconsin that got to do some pretty cool things in Hollywood. And I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, what are you looking for? They said, well, how about you just teach him some dance moves and tell your story? And I said, sure. And they gave me a date and I, I set up, uh, set up shop. And, and so I came over there. I, I taught the, the students some, some dance moves. There was maybe 50 or 75 kids there. And uh, I remember enjoying it a lot. I remember being there. And when I was done, I had these students coming up to me, telling me how much my story impacted their life. And I remember feeling like, man, this feels I think I lost you or it froze. Gotta love internet. Yeah. Sorry, dude. That's a bummer. No, that's okay. Hey, so you were just talking about, I remember feeling like. Okay. So I, uh, I remember feeling like, man, this is just how I feel like when I'm done performing, um, you know, as a dancer, this is amazing. And I remember that stuck with me and I got, I got done and I walked over to the director. I mean, I had students coming to me and, and talking to me for probably 30 minutes after my presentation. It was pretty amazing. And I walked to the director and the director had tears in her eyes. And she goes, I just can't tell you how much I that really meant a lot to us that you would come and spend time with our students. And she goes, I think you changed some lives today. And man, that statement shook me. And she handed me an envelope and I was like, I was kind of in a daze, you know, just kind of taking it all in. And so I go outside to my car and I open the envelope because I'm nosy. I'll admit it. <laughs> um, couldn't even wait to get home. I opened the envelope and in it was a thank you note with a $250 check. And when she had called me, we'd never talked about money. I just, she asked me to come and I said, yes. And I said, wait a minute. I could get paid to do this. <laughs> and that's when it started clicking for me. Like there is not just one way. There's a million. And in the, in the industry that I was in, the, the way was, you know, you needed to get representation. You needed to move out to LA or at the time, New York. And you needed to get, you know, some dance agency to send you to all these different auditions. And you needed to make sure that you got, you know, you, 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 you got found and you got picked up and you got booked these commercials. And nowadays it's, you know, you need to make sure that you're building your social media up so you can get all these brand deals and make sure that everybody sees you're out there. And if you don't do it this way, then you don't have it. You're not considered a working dancer. That's a bunch of garbage. There are so many different ways that you can take your, your, your passions, your skill sets, your, your dream. And if you're willing to change your perspective the opportunities are endless. And I started to realize I don't need Hollywood. <laughs> In fact, I didn't even really care for the industry as what it was. It was really cutthroat. It was not a, it was not an uplifting. Everybody's trying to tear everybody down. It was, it was not good. And so I started to realize there's a different way I can build this thing. And that's exactly what I did. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book, Dream Life Planner, Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered by Noel L. Peterson, available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at 
empower, E-M-P-O-W-E-R, to dream.com. That's empower, number two, dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. So let's talk a little bit more about your your choice to, to make an impact and, and, and make a difference and do something completely different. Yeah, I think, you know, I think impact, it's such a, it's such a powerful word when you think about it. We weren't created for ourselves. Oh. You know, we were created to, I believe that everybody on the planet, everybody, I don't care where you're sitting. If you're in your kitchen right now, if you're in your car right now, listening to this, I don't care if you know, you're, you're, you're in the house and you're about to lose your mind because your kids are running around driving you crazy. And you can't even think about how you're going to get out of your, your front door, let alone how to even get anywhere else in the world. But I'm going to tell you this, you were created to make an impact period. Here's where we get hung up. And this is what I got hung up on. We just weren't created to impact everybody. Hmm but we were created to impact somebody. So Our job is to go find that somebody and double down. There is a group of people. There is a, there is whether that's a group of five people, a group of 5,000 or a group of 5 million. We were all created to make an impact. And I believe money is just a result or a report card of your impact. Hmm. Now you could say, but Jesse, I, I work for Hormel. I just sit and bag chili all day long. Well, you're impacting the world through helping people have food, but you're getting paid 20 bucks an hour to do it. Okay. But then there's people that are out there doing things in a big way. That's helping people feed 5 million people. And if you take a look at it, you take a look at the people that have made the most money. They have the peop they are the people that make the largest impact. Hmm. And so now you can make an impact negatively or you can make an impact positively. It's up to you on how you decide to wield that power. And I believe he who is faithful in the little things will be blessed with much. So the more you make an impact and you look at somebody and say, I'm going to make an impact for that one. And you treat it as though you are trying to impact a million. You'll get to your million. Mm. And so I really think that that is, is really important. I, I remember doing a show. I got a record deal in 2013 and I quickly went on a tour and this one was a small regional tour just to kind of work out the kinks for our larger tour. And um, we were at this, we were at this church carnival and people were all over. I mean, it was, it was super scattered. Um, I mean, the church that hi, that brought us in, we, there was two, two bands they brought in. And uh, you know, I remember the first band that had, that was with us. They were a lot better, better known. And, you know, they, 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 they get there and we're setting up all the gear and we're getting everything, but everybody's running around. And, and, and it was a, it, it wasn't that well of attended event. It was probably 150 people. And in the space that they were using, you could have probably packed three or 4,000 people in there. So it seemed really sparse. And I remember we did the sound check. They did one song. <laughs> They did one song and there was three people standing in front of us watching <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, it's all yours. We're done. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He goes, this isn't worth our time. Now they were already paid. What did they mean? This wasn't filling my ego. This wasn't, this wasn't make, giving me the likes on Instagram. This wasn't giving me the followers on social. So you know what? Why would I spend my time? for three people that don't even have a cell phone because they're too small to have a cell phone. <laughs> Ouch. And that always stuck with me because we went out there and I was like, well, we're here. I'm just going to do the thing. And by the time I was done, you want to know how many people were there watching five. 
Hey, you doubled the crowd. But I doubled, yeah, I doubled the crowd. But here was something that was interesting. I got a call three days later from a guy that was at the that was at the carnival. He says, "Hey, we're putting on a show. It's going to be about two thousand people. We'll pay you X, which was actually double what we got paid to do this show." And he says, "I couldn't help but notice." you were performing for those five kids like you're performing for 10,000. Mm. Nice. And he says, I don't know really much about you, but to be honest with you, I don't care because I can tell you don't do this for the clout. You do this because you care. Mm. Nice. And that has always stuck with me. Nice. So let's talk about character. You mentioned that you can make your impact good or bad. So how valuable has character been as you're developing this bigger impact? Man, uh, your character is, is your muscle because, you know, John Maxwell talks about in his, in his book, the 21 irrefutable laws of growth, he talks about the leadership lid. And I think leadership and character are kind of synonymous with one another, right? They, they go hand in hand with one another. And you will never be able to outperform your character. You'll never be able to sustain beyond your character. And listen, I'm, I'm still learning this lesson. (laughs) There's days, there's times that I outkick my character just straight up. There's a lot of people that'll get out there and want to tell you their resume about all the things they've done. Well, I might've had some really cool moments in my life. Yes, but I have done some really stupid things. (laughs) And, and what I have known, what I have found to be true is that because character is a muscle, it is something you constantly need to be working on. Mm-hmm. It's not like you go on a 12 month escapade to build your character and then you're good. It's just like a muscle. If I work out in the gym for 12 months straight, sure, I can become shredded. If I stop, I don't sustain that growth. I don't sustain that muscle mass that I, that I accrued, right? I don't, I don't keep body of after, you know, uh, all that work. If I stop, your muscles start to atrophy. Your character will start to atrophy. Hmm. And so I have learned that when I take my ball, when I take my eye off the prize and stop realizing that this is more an inward game than it is an external game, um, start things start to happen in a negative way. And so it's a constant reminder to me that I always have to be building my character. Well, and, and thinking about that, that inward game, how has gratitude served you? Um, you know, that is something that I've struggled with. Um, you know, I, I've tried a million times to be a, to be a journaler. I get like three or four days in and I feel like I'm doing great. And then I fall off for like six months. Um, You know, I do find that when I spy for me, I spend time in, in prayer and reading the Bible consistently. And when I do that, I do find myself being more gracious and and being more grateful because I do realize, man, um, God's done a lot for me in my life. It's hard for me to, to reflect and not realize that. So that's kind of how I, I, I focus on gratitude, but I will tell you that I, for the longest time was a natural problem finder, (laughs) not a problem solver. I got my importance from telling, from being able to find all the problems. And I remember one of my mentors saying, Jesse, people don't pay you for problems (laughs) because they can find those anywhere they pay for solutions. And I had to realize that gratitude is a solution. And so when I'm having a bad day, when I'm, when a project's going really south, I have to find myself stepping back and taking a look. Okay. Where have I, where, what do I have? What's working well? What have I been blessed with? And I sometimes have to speak it out loud just to flip my perspective. So I'm not focused on all the things that aren't going right at that moment. But when I don't do that consistently, and I have a tendency to start focusing on the negative, uh, everything around you starts to crumble. And, uh, you know, 
Tony Robbins has been coined and I know he took it from somebody else and I can't remember who it was, but where, where focus goes, energy flows. When you're focused on problems and negativity, you kind of tend to get more of it. <laughs> and when you focus on your gratitude and all the things that you're blessed with and all the things you're grateful for, you tend to get more of it. That's so good. So now let's talk about building your audience. Now you've, you've basically started your own industry, your own um, model. What, what's worked well in, in building this audience and creating this? This is something again, that I've honestly struggled with. Um, and part of this is because for me, this is, I'm not trying to sell a widget. I'm not trying to build a hedge fund for the type of business that I want to have, which is an impact driven business. Don't get me wrong. Yes, it's a revenue driven business, but it's an impact driven business. I have constantly struggled with identifying my audience because one of two things, I didn't really want to get honest with who I truly was. And I believe that in order to really truly be able to make an impact on who you were designed to impact, you have to fully embrace who you were, who you are, because you are equipped to impact that audience. But when you won't double down on yourself, when you won't allow yourself to be you, when you try to buy $3,000 suits and tailor them over and over and over again, but they don't fit you because you weren't built to wear them suits you will constantly be in a hamster wheel trying to build and rebuild and rediscover and retool and do all these kinds of things. When I finally just broke down and embraced the fact that I was a performer and I was an entrepreneur, I was a coach and I was a mentor. I was, um, I, I was somebody that loved to be on stage, but I was also somebody that loved to build businesses. And I could have both at the same time. It just meant that I wasn't going to go probably work with the CEO of a Fortune 500 company for the most part. That's okay. Because early in my coaching career, that's what I tried to do. I wanted to just, I wanted to just be able to follow the money. <laughs> when you follow the money, you're going to end up in the wrong ditch. I promise you. So, I started to learn to double down on who I was and being okay with that, you know? And, and the other thing is we try to be too many things to too many people. Mm. And I really believe that it's, it's when you start to narrow your focus, you widen your impact. Mm. But so many people want to widen their focus because they think that, well, I can help everybody. And when you try to help everybody, you can't help anybody. And so um, that's really where I've learned to build my audience is understanding who I am and who I can serve the best. Oh, that's so good. So let's talk a little bit about your niche and, and how niching down was really helped you nail your impact. Well, when you start to niche down, you start to, you know, it, it impacts what, how you speak. So whether you're on social media, whether you're out at a conference speaking or you're, um, you're on a, a podcast like this, or, uh, you are designing your Facebook ads or your Instagram ads, like everything goes into the niche because as soon as you niche down, you start to learn how to directly speak to the heart of that individual because instead of trying to talk to 50 people, you're really talking to one. But this is where people really clam up because they're like, man, I don't want to just talk to my business can't sustain off of helping one person. <laughs> so they get really hard. And, and a guy that I started to learn a lot of this stuff from Pedro Adeo, uh, you know, talks about you need to find a niche so narrow that you're the only one that fits in it. <laughs> and when you do that though, you're speaking to the heart of the person and, and they're like, man, this person gets me. And you, you, we've heard this all in sales training and trust me, I've led my share of sales training, 
right? And it says that the the key that people buy from people they like, know, and trust. How do you how do people get to like, know, and trust you when you speak to their heart? And they're like, this person gets me. Because what, what, what Tony Robbins talks about is how do you influence people? You influence people by understanding what already influences them. The only way for you to do that is to understand and appreciate their world. How do they know that you understand and appreciate their world? When you start speaking to their problems, when you start speaking to their challenges, when you start speaking to the, the thoughts that they're having in their head, they're starting to go, man, my, my goodness. I mean, I know my phone follows me around everywhere. But is it, have they now found a way to plant a chip in my brain and read all the thoughts? Because this guy's reading my homework. That's when your niching down starts to become very powerful. And this is what I tell my clients. Even if you have a small pool of people, what's going to happen is your small pool of people are going to get results. And everybody around them is looking at the result. And what's happening is they're, the people that are around them are like, I want to get that result. They're not looking at the other person and saying, oh, well, you're a busy working mom. So I guess that's not going to work for me. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, single young professional male. So I guess that's not going to, no, they're going to say, I don't know what in the world you're doing, but I want that result. So then you start even hitting people that are outside your market when you start serving your uh, audience well. Nice. So let's talk about relationships and how connections have uh, helped you build. Hmm. Uh, my grandpa taught me this, that relationships are, um, relationships are the world's currency. Hmm. I have had more opportunities come my way, big opportunities, opportunities that have been life-changing personally and professionally, not because of an audition I meant to, not because of a sales letter I sent, not because of a, of a workshop, a free workshop I did because of a relationship I built with somebody over time. And here's the key. I built the relationship with the person because I valued the person, not the position they could put me in. Mm, so good. We have to stop seeing people as chess pieces and start seeing them as human beings oh. and start treating them like they are valuable because our value comes from who we are, not what we do. That's why we're called human beings, not human doings. And when we stop trying to, yes, I believe in being strategic and building strategic partnerships, but when that is the only basis in which you build relationships, or that's the only way that you build basis on valuing people, you start getting into, start getting into to trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, since we're talking about relationships, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. So what was your most memorable date? My most memorable date? Yeah. Like date uh, as far as a, as far as like with, like, with a like, female or yeah. like. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> man, that's, uh, man, that's a good, a good, a good question. Um, I think, you know, it wasn't even, it wasn't even with a, a, a female. I think one of my most memorable like moments with a friend was, I, you know, it actually happened probably six months ago. I, uh, I went through a lot of tough things over the last three years. And I, I remember I was living out in LA again. Um, and I was really struggling with some things that were going on in, in my personal life, things that were going on with my business. And I remember being on the phone with somebody, uh, one of my, uh, now one of my best friends. Um, and I was talking with him about what I was going through. And I was walking down this, this path and it was like this long, this long, uh, uh, um, kind of like a bike trail and, and off in the distance, you could see the mountains. It was a beautiful, beautiful view. 
And it was almost as though I was chatting with him about, you know, my life and I could see this road that was kind of showing me, Hey, there's much more here than what your perspective is allowing you to see. And what was memorable about this was the things that he said to me in reference to what I was saying that made me feel the most heard I've ever felt in my entire life. And what it really, it really started to help me see is that one of the best ways to make an impact in somebody's life, one of the best ways to build a relationship with somebody, one of the best ways to make a memorable moment for somebody is for them to feel, uh, be, for them to feel seen and feel heard. Hmm. And I think that will be a moment for the rest of my life that I will remember. And it will also be one of my best lessons on how to be a valuable relationship for somebody else. Because oftentimes I try to make it about myself. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Don't we all? So I know that now you're building a, a new audience with a new, a new concept, right? Do you want to share, share what you're doing? Yeah. So, I mean, we, uh, we, we had this show called the worldwide dance challenge. Um, and I also help, you know, small, small companies scale. So people that are doing between 500,000 to $1.5 million in revenue, I take them to three to five in two years. And that's one thing that I do, but the, 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 Kind of the interesting thing that happened out of COVID is, is me and uh, my business partner started developing this show called Worldwide Dance Challenge, where we took dancers from literally all around the world, from all different styles, had them compete head to head live online in front of a, a, a live audience. And it was one of the most cool things ever. You had people from Russia competing, somebody in South Africa at in real time and, you know, getting to banter back and forth, having live judges watch them. And uh, just, it was such a cool, it was such a cool experience. And, you know, out of that, we learned a lot of lessons and we're going to be doing season two here, but we're, we're, uh, you know, we're re we're retooling things because we learned a lot. Um, one of the things that we learned was that these dancers really needed some guidance in not only um, how to become, you know, better dancers, but how to become better entrepreneurs, how to look at the world differently. Because in my opinion right now, if you try to make it as a dancer, you're going to have a really tough time making it. Hmm. But if you try to make it as an entrepreneur that dances, you got a much easier time because there's a lot more opportunity than the narrow one you're creating for yourself as just a dancer. And so, um, we, uh, I mean, we had, uh, we went from an unknown show to streaming in 125 countries in less than six months, all organic, and um, just have uh, an amazing group of people that have su supported the show, have constantly encouraged us and, and said that the show is a big inspiration to them. Um, and so out of that, um, I built this concept of called, called my creative district where I'm helping creatives. So your performers, your singers, your dancers, your, your musicians build a business out of their passion to perform. And these are, these are people that have already been there and done that. So they, they kind of had a similar to experience. Me came home with their tail between their legs because they thought that they failed. And now we're resurrecting that dream and helping them see that they can, they can approach it in a different manner and probably have a more um, fulfilling future because they're doing it in a different way. Love the opportunity to help people resurrect dreams. That's exciting. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So what inspires you? Man, what inspires me? Um, do you know what inspires me is some of the people that I get to work with every day that they're looking at really tough odds and they don't give up <laughs> and they keep going. Um, my clients inspire me. Nice. Um, my, 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 you know, some of my closest friends inspire me. I've surround, I've, I've been intentional surrounding myself with people that are fighters and are constantly fighting for not only their own dreams, but fighting for the dreams of others. 
and watching watching them you know overcome adversity and obstacles and stuff like that that's that's really what inspires me nice i really like that so what's uh what's been your biggest challenge obviously you mentioned there was a lot going on over the last three years um, what, what's been the biggest challenge and, and how'd you push through it um my biggest challenge has been realizing that your past mistakes don't have to be your future mm. um you know i uh I, like I said, I went through a lot of struggles. I had a lot of um, things personally and professionally that happened. And, you know, I realized some of my mistakes that I made in, in, in that. And, and sometimes you look at those mistakes and you're like, one, that means that I don't deserve to succeed now because I made some bad choices. Oh. I made some, some mistakes, um, you know, or, or you, you start to think of maybe I'm just not made for success. Maybe I'm just not made to do this thing, you know? And so I, I think the biggest challenge that I've had because I've put myself around the right people and because I've had proper mentors in my life, they were able to pull me out of that and to help me through that. But realizing that you do not have to be dis defined by your failure or, dis or your mistakes, that, that that's not, that's not what defines you, but it can be what actually catapults you if you let it. Ooh. And what I have found is that some of my biggest mistakes by me being vulnerable about it, by me talking about it has given me opportunity to make impact in people's lives and have opened opportunities for me to be able to do things professionally that I wouldn't have been able to do had I not just been vulnerable about the mistakes I've made. So um, I think that's that's a challenge that I've had to go through, but it's also been a, a really big uh, growing point for me and and uh, a learning lesson for me. Oh, that's so good. All right, so what's your big dream? Um, my big dream is to have a business that's making an impact on a million performers, helping them live out their dream and make the impact that they were created to make and be able to make the income that they need to make to be able to have the lifestyle that they've wanted. Um, that's really the, the goal of my creative district in the next 10 years. That's fantastic. All right. So now one of those young entrepreneurs is sitting across from you. You're having coffee. And your chance to just give them Jesse's words of wisdom before they go. Hmm. People underestimate what you can do. People overestimate what they can do in 12 months and they underestimate what they can do in a decade. Don't stop or don't give up or don't believe that it's not going to happen because it doesn't happen fast enough. <laughs> Anything that's worthwhile takes time. And so with all of Instagram, with all of social media, TikTok, everything, people going viral, the illusion of overnight success is at an all-time high. Oh. And, you know, the, the thing that I want people to, the thing that I would want them to understand is that you stay consistent by taking the right actions, put yourself in front of the right people that can guide you through those actions and stay focused on the small wins. Make sure you set yourself up for small wins. It's okay if Madison Square Garden is your end result, but don't lose heart if you don't get there by next week. Right. And, um, and so make sure that you, I, you know, identify your big dream, but then identify some small goals with that, get around the right people and realize consistency is key. And it's not consistent leaps and bounds, it's consistent steps. Mm. Consistent steps taken one after another over a long period of time will guarantee you success. Nice. Jesse, thank you so much for joining me today, sharing such great wisdom and putting yourself out there. I definitely appreciate you being on the show. Absolutely, brother. No problem. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, or leave a review. We have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com. That's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast, and we want to give them to you for free. addvaluemindset.com.
In our next episode, AJ Alutwala talks about the power of partners in business and how having a partner that was strong in areas where he wasn't was powerful in moving their business forward. He is blessed to be living the American dream and he doesn't take it for granted and wants to share it with others, including his son who's building a business and a YouTube channel. Grow from your failures.